Hello everyone, today we talk about the Calubus that uh, many people haven't legitimately heard, ever heard of. They were also known as the Caldoi, right? Um, ancient people um, mentioned by classical authors as living in Pontus and Cappadocia, so essentially the regions in northern Anatolia. In the broader classical uh, period, we talk about them because they are one of the tribes encountered by Xenophon during his Anabasis. And as such, considering the, the period, and so still like in, uh, in Achaemenid times in the region, uh, constituting a part of the uh, forces of the Achaemenid army, right, as subjects uh, that had a relation with the kings of kings, as we can imagine, their nobility was uh, co-opted to some degree by the Persians, uh, and their levies, right, are to be considered. They're not known as far as the Persian wars are concerned, but they decided to insert them for encyclopedistic reasons of completion uh, in uh, the in the account, first of all, of the ancient military historical units also as auxiliaries of the Achaemenid army. Uh, it's interesting because Anatolia has uh, actually a quite composite, um, say, population, uh, territories, histories, uh, and so on, right? In the Hellenistic period, uh, the region would be mostly famous for the large amount of Turiophoroi that the uh, local um, polities, right, of essentially Hellenistic, even if they weren't exactly the Adokoi at some point, some, some were like, um, but others were just sort of more oriental powers that um, were, however, heavily Hellenistic in nature and had similar units. And I'm not going to talk about the Kalubas that are actually described as different uh, unit types from the Turioferoi by Xenophon, and that's why we talk about them. But it's important to stress, like, given the um, typization that is provided by the, the Hellenic author about these people, of the, of the infantries that existed in this uh, Mashrek region. And so, essentially, uh, mountaineers, right, um, tough, um, let's say, melee infantries that were not particularly heavily armored or, you know, professional in nature, but that in this rugged territory were, of course, quite up to things like defending their, their homes uh, and uh, raiding each other's cattle uh, at Similia, right? And that are characterized, as, as you see also from, from the picture that I realized um, through artificial intelligence, but through, like, some on the basis of uh, valid uh, reconstructions. Um, is characterized like a spearman that is pretty much the standard, as you understand, but more precisely, a, a long spearman, a, a pikeman, you could um, say. Um, this doesn't actually, this lends itself to different um, levels of interpretation, because the Turioferoi, as we have already made a video on them, uh, as you know, are characterized as still, like, yes, heavy infantry, but being... Uh, heavy infantry in the sense of, again, being able to hold the ground against skirmishers, fundamentally, that are the lights, in that sense, but also very light within the heavies, right, and capable, in fact, of alternating certain tactical roles, also of harassment, uh, etc. And the reason why they are in this context is that most troops, right, most uh, fighters that you could draw from this Anatolian interland, as many other areas, like for example the Balkan one, right, there were lots of uh, ethnicities, as you know, think about the uh, the Agranians or the, you know, it's plenty of uh, the same Thracians in, 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 to some degree, like the, the, the Lyrian troops we made recently a bit about their tactics, that were, um, say, uh, just very pretty much the same, like this kind of standard fighter of, say, the continental uh, context of classical antiquity that were equipped with, say, a novel shield, a couple of javelins, a spear, 
uh, if you could distinguish javelins from spears of some degree and with some form of armor, side weapon. Um, and um, depending on, of course, the, the, the wealth, the, the, the wealth, the power of the of the single tribes, of the single, uh, single peoples, like being more or less stereotypically representable. And the reason why this was the most common type of unit in the ancient world, like in, at least in the sanitary one, um, so yes, the overwhelming majority by demographic concentration um, are, you know, something I never answer in a single video, but of course it has to do with the political, military, and social balance that uh, rendered this type of infantry in more or less capable of holding the ground in different situations, like from pitched battles to uh, to guerrilla. Uh, and that, uh, as we've seen, are uh, like uh, qualitative as long as they mostly have a collective training of some sort individually they're very performing but if they don't have like a, a familiarity with the with tactics drills um, and like they, they're under a firm authority that can discipline them adequately they're not going to put up a great uh, fight uh, at what you know the unit level that is the most important one uh, at the end of the day so when you find um, expressly described uh, people's equipped like this one stereotypically with long spears first of all this doesn't mean that all the calibers that we'll, now we will introduce also in a um in a ethnological uh, ethnographical sense um it doesn't mean that of course that we're all equipped with that but not only but we shouldn't be um thinking that there was any specific reason why say this specific people was in this case for example by xenophon because it happens often with in ancient history with the, the, the quite sketchy info that we have of mostly like bunch say the, the, any other people that is not like sort of the most documented ones that were rendered more protagonistic by the Greeks by the by the Romans having fought against them uh, and that thus um, it's just like are, are just described uh cursorily right uh, accidentally almost so if xenophon had encountered these troops fighting as pikemen fundamentally it doesn't mean that the behind the calibers from the way we can identify them historically there was something anywhere near to like you know some some sort of deep strategical capacity or whatever it could be of course the indicator of some sort of cohesion and political compactness of such uh, groups like uh, more being more or less capable of like fighting in like in a in a phalanx essentially not in the in the in the narrowly defined term that we used to describe of course mostly the phalanx i mean the essentially the Hellenic and the macedonian ones right the um the greeks were quite un unspecific themselves about the description basically every single heavy infantry they fought again they ever fought their new uh, uh they called phalanx right which means tree lock basically so the roman legionaries are phalanx the the carthaginian long coffroy are phalanx right the the celtic uh war bands have are phalanx right so this is completely normal and you shouldn't be fooled by things like oh my god look at these people it's called um you know it, it's mentioned by xenophon Right, having this long spear, so my God, they they must have been sp specializing in that tactics and what who knows what's behind that. Absolutely not. Right, this is the case even for, for example, how many times you've heard I don't know the mention of the Helvetic phalanxes of, uh, uh, in, in the Celtic context, and everybody saying, oh my God, the the Helvetians may have had they must have had some this specialized type of fighting. That the other Gauls, like the other Celts, did not really have. And that, you know, there's such complication behind that. They must have copied this from the classical military cultures because you look like in geography, they're closer like to the Mediterranean. So whatever. Complete nonsense, right? You know, these guys fought all in the same identical fashion, right? And the fact that, again, uh, once they deployed in a particular formation, it was also pretty much the same. Like, what's what's specific about a pike? It's literally, by definition, a long spear. Like, everybody can have it. 
you can argue that, um, as we were saying before, like you need more collective training to effectively wield a pi for a functional unit to operate. But first, every single people did that. But in case you didn't know, or you didn't know in general, like every single you know peasant militia can pick up a ground using pikes or spears of any sort and sort of holding the ground in that formation. Right? It, it doesn't take any professionalism, any specificity, whatever. Of course, they will not have a functional capacity to advance, take on, you know, um, enemies simply, but maintaining the, the formation successfully. Um, and they will essentially pass, as we will see now, also to different types of, um, you know, other side weapons, right? That, and of course, it was nothing standard, even just about the pike itself. The spear is sort of the universal weapon among pretty much all these people. Think about how sometimes the Celts are characterized as swordsmen, just because, of course, for certain classical altars, it was important to stress that the war bands, being more professional and looting, also, you know, richer peoples, etc., mostly were displaying this sword as a major prize um, of their, you know, military uh, capacity, etc. But it, it's not that conceptually, like, that there is a people that uses just swords and other um, spears. Like, they mostly all use spears, and uh, also just the ways different weapons are used, it's also contingental, um, as it, it is in this case. So, um, never make the mistake of thinking that, say, since a guy has a long spear, like a, a, a pike, and this means, oh my god, this guy's had a Macedonian phalanx, they must have gotten it from, well, at this point, even at not Alexander, because that tactics did not exist in the first place. Um, you know, I mean, pikemen did exist, but not in the, say, the, the Macedonian phalanx is more like a tactics, right, that includes the phalanx and the cavalry, which is a very different thing, even just from what properly, you know, People erroneously presume, like, oblitic warfare have, having uh, evolved into the phalanx, like, you know, in the Macedonian one. Um, uh, that's not how it happened. It's a completely different tactical principle in the first place. It's not just because you have a guy that has similar equipment that that makes, like, the Macedonian um, uh, phalanx, the evolution of the, the, the classical Hellenic one. That's not how the, it really happened. Um, and I discussed this in other videos. So equally for these peoples, it obviously did not really have a state that we can define as such, especially considering the ones that existed already at this point in history could not and did not have the capacity to have like large bodies of um, uniformly drilled pikemen that could, I don't know, advance, take on different formations um, with the steam rolling, um, you know, functionality of the later Hellenistic phalanx and so on. It, this is practically nothing to do with that. Um, just it remains as, a, as an idea that, that the fact that these guys were were at least fighting at some point in the way they were documented by Xenophon in that fashion, right? And the Greeks were a bit like, and we inherited this from them as Westerners in our deepest ways of thinking, like um, this, um, this sense of categorization for which um, you didn't have to, mu to do too much philosophy, because the, the Hellenic thought is actually more complicated than it seems. Like, it's not that uh, Xenophon was thinking, like, okay, no, we categorize the Calubus as pikemen, in, in a way. To just say that I noticed that they were fighting in the, in the context, they saw it like that, and I, as a Greek, do not need to digress on the obvious realization that there are other peoples fighting like that, uh, that also that I may have even heard of and seen among the others that I document for Asia Minor. I'm just documenting again as a Greek the, say, the deformity of the world outside our perfect Hellenic one, for which all these barbarians fight in sort of characteristically different ways, at least in the way they manifest themselves at our, um, uh, at our gaze, let's say, and um, of course Xenophon at that point was carrying like a, a military culture that had, of course, deeply, um, let's say, uh, developed that, that sense of uh, civic, like, um, you know, political 
uh, let's say participation as a community that had to maintain certain degrees of um, in fact uniformity of um, of at least of order that was more ordered more um, directly participative in that Hellenic uh, uh, perfection in the world that they thought from Dorian times to have properly founded and you know stamped from and as divinely blessed for and looking at these other people saying you know they aren't like us and they are something strange and different and characteristic and exotic and eccentric and whatever so that's why we get often just for these people like um, this is not just the only mansion but in a military sense right at this point it, they're basically it otherwise we can understand how more or less uh, a Kalubas army would have fought without even having information about that because more or less again in the region everybody fought pretty much in the same way right um, so the Kalubas were settled in Chaldea uh, the, the, the properly their native land stretching from the Alus River to Farnakeia and Trabzon in the east right and they reached as far as uh, south as eastern Anatolia so they actually occupied a quite interesting territory that is quite um, as we were saying uh, rugged it has um, quite an anorography and, and you may that the, the sense that again the guys were leave, living in on highlands it's not even just entirely highlands um, by the way because it's very extended and big territory by the way and um, that would use only one specific type of tactics like the aforementioned in let's say in the Swiss highland like you know uh, they must have used the phalanx because they were like entrenching on the on the mountains on the hills it it's not a thing, right? That's not how the art of war evolved historically. Uh, the capacity of having, as we just said, clans capable of deploying in a functional formation at some point depended on the uh, the political cohesion, the trust in the in the chieftains, the you know the the motivation, how they were. Uh, supplied uh, whether they, they knew each other what was the, the general purpose for which they were there so um, at this point all local infantry from quite a while are fighting in the dense uh, battle line um, and so it's not a surprise um, like you, you could think of the Calibus not having again even that very high level of cohesion actually on average uh, aside from this pike pike men vision let's say um and being more relying actually on i don't know more open order uh, fighting right and even you know suitable weapons right that here are not documented but for example the anatolian interland was full of axes to some degree and mountaineers shepherds people were really very tough grounds so it could be also very different within the same caldea here for example um, and according to Apollonius of Rhodes, the Calibus were believed historically to have had a uh, Scythian origin, right? to have essentially settled down from a nomadic past from probably the, the Scythian world, right? Which is interesting and also realistic to some extent, um, as um, the the area had been and would keep uh, getting um, they invaded settled by Iranian shepherds, like of automatic background, actually from quite a while, we've seen it um, in the videos about the Eurasian steppes, um, um, and especially in these earlier times, we didn't talk about the Kalubas or other people around, but um, it's quite plausible in the first place. Um, the Kalboi, Kalubas, Mosunoikoi, and Tibareni were also considered among the first nations overall to master iron working as recorded by classical authors which is yet another interesting connection with um, the say the, the, the metallurgical advancements of the steppes um, part of which were absorbed also by Caucasus uh, where as you know we've seen it in, in Armenian history for example like there was a, an abundance of of um, metals for suitable for um, for armament 
And this is yet another indicator of some sort of warlike background of these populations, something a bit more tribal than actually simply settled down at this point. The name Calubus is derived from the Hellenic word Calubus, uh, meaning uh, tempered iron or steel, which was later, in fact, famously adopted into uh, the Latin Calubs, which uh, is quite famous about the uh, Calubs noricum uh, that still is extracted still in today's equivalent Austrian mines that is particularly well carbonized iron for like that uh, achieving naturally the level of what we call technically in engineering it's not even a thing anymore but it's still technically chemically steel all right um, and um, and again these guys lived also in territories that did have that that good carbonized iron historically some scholars believed that the Hellenic name Kaliba is also related to the Hittite phrase Kaliva which means land of the Alus river which may not exactly say it would disprove in fact the aforementioned etymology unfortunately we know too few um, about these populations ethnonyms and in general like we just have to go with different um, uh, say notions right rumors because we do not even know how precisely they, they spoke like we can't say much um, however and this is also interesting and tells you about the variety of, of, of warfare that we can contemplate rather than a specific people or tribe the term Calibus was often used by the ancient uh, Hellenes to refer to various groups of peoples who lived in fact along the Black Sea coast and traded in iron which is in fact very unspecific um, and it encompasses different groups that in fact we do not witness being particularly cohesive in a political sense uh, just being tribes fundamentally um, so in other words it's a generic term that encompasses several distinct cultures and if the Greeks called them religious like them for their iron um, uh, craft and, and commerce it's just like a, a, an even less ethnically specific definition uh, needless to say the area was also quite ethnically um, composite right not not excessively but I mean that there wasn't just like a specifically prevalent people that you could sort of ascribe to one specific ethnic background or another right it's it was just like a what a melting pot or a cauldron of different groups that had historically um, mostly sedentarized there. Now, our primary sources for understanding the history of the Caldoi come from the accounts written by classical authors, such as as early as Homer, Strabo, the same Xenophon, um, the um, the, the, the specifics actually about Xenophon's description of uh, the um, uh, of the Calubus comes from Curopidea, um, which is not the Anabasis, but I believe it's the same. Because first of all, we do not know when the the two were exactly written. We're talking about the seventies of the fourth century BC and um, Xenophon's um, you know crossing of Anatolia during the Anabasis, in fact, it was literally across the same uh, Calubas territory, just right? So we can't take the information um, really from both, um, say that in a general sense. And the reason why, you know, the Curopidea is just like this, in fact, uh, treatise written for Cyrus the Great, um, and um, the they also help resolving this dispute between the Armenians and the Chaldeans, in fact, over agricultural land, which tells you, of course, that they were sedentary peoples by now. But as you know, a bit um, visited every once in a while by some um, nomadic war band, which was really in those areas, like something would continue until uh, Roman times, think about Aryans, you know tactic that we discussed also recently in the video about the, Ro the, the early imperial Roman battle array, right? 
Now, in Roman times, the Calve and the Calibus were mentioned by Plutarch as residing in Pontus and Cappadocia, just for, you know, seeing them on the radar. I made a video about uh, Roman Cappadocia, for sure, and if I'm not wrong, the same Pontus. Yes, Pontus and Bithynia, I think I coupled them, right? Uh, Pliny the Elder also wrote about the Armeno Calibus, Right, uh, that, as you understand from the name, it was a tribe living between Trebzon and Armenia. Uh, again, in, in the videos about the Roman provinces, I discuss a bit what the uh, economy, of, like the society of these peoples, was about. Um, and again, it's uh, it had changed by by that point much from Xenophon's times uh, in the first place. Now, despite the ancient accounts linking the Calibus to the Scythians, some modern scholars think that they were actually a Georgian tribe. And this is quite fascinating. Um, there are, like, say, there are not, I'm not an expert, honestly, about these things, but um, it's surely all, uh, this much I'm certain that they're just hypotheses, right? There's no certainty whatsoever, right? Um, it's been claimed that the offspring of the Calibus would be today's Zans, a Kartvelian ethnic group living today's Turkey. Um, there is one surviving word only from the Chaldean language, that is Kakamar. It is the, the Chaldean name for the Black Sea. And this does suggest, because of Mars, just like in Germanic, in Italic, etc., in the European languages. And this does make us think that, after all, Anatoly was heavily uh, settled by the Indo Europeans, all right? And it's just until, I don't know, the Middle Ages, the things also, just mostly from a cultural point of view, began to, to change, um, at least linguistically, etc. So, of course, there were other groups were not of Indo-European language, but again, this um, waves from the steppes, from even the east, really, from Iran itself, telling the truth, um, had been molding the local ethnicities quite much. So, we know that few, it's that big, but it's what Xenophon writes about the Calibus equipment that is fascinating. First of all, their uh, defensive gear, their armor consisted in a helmet. We do not know which type. Um, you can imagine, of course, the elite having heavier metal ones, but something a bit more organic and uh, and cheap, of course, in nature. We'll see now what more or less the rest of the equipment sounds like. This is even if they're not a particularly wealthy people, right? Even though they. They were good at mythology, etc. It's something we we discuss also for Armenia in medieval times. The fact that some lands are advanced in mythology or um, like even, are even famous for the availability of metal for the, their armor doesn't ipso facto make these armies better armored in, in general than say necessarily their neighbors, right? This is something you can see in. In many cultures, even the Celts, like yes, they were excellent um, smiths, but how many of their troops actually did go into battle armored compared to say you know other peoples? Um, this, of course, is something you have to answer depending on mostly the stages of development involved. Here, in Xenophon's times, like in the fourth century BC, in the, fifth, in the end of the fifth, uh, is surely quite a um, and things wouldn't change even too too fast. Like we can imagine a bit more primitive background. We see, however, the mention of greaves, which usually fit like some sort of general heavier equipment. Maybe exactly because they would fight. Uh, maybe you know with the spikes. You know, we can imagine you know some guys getting down, trying to to cut somebody's leg, right? And this would even make you think about how political warfare overall. And it's not like the, the Greeks, as we were saying before, were the only people who fought in thickly packed 
you know heavily um, heavily armored infantry like especially in the first ranks we can imagine the calibers having like as it was normal like actually as we know from the saying xenophon remaining true for most of military history like the best guys being the ones of the front um, ranks right and so um, that made a, a lot of sense for for many reasons we can't quite uh, digress on but this would have been of course understood by by all peoples fighting uh, with heavy infantry that at this point has fully consolidated that towards the end of the uh, second half of the first millennium BC um, the the point though is that we don't see at least Xenophon as I was saying before does not mention a shield right what does this mean that the Calibus did not have a shield of course they had it it's just Xenophon says okay well no, I'm just pointing out what is kind of interesting for me as a Greek Right, it just it would have had a normal barbarian shield of some sort, or like the other. Like he would have not made the least for every people. Like saying, these guys have this shield which is oval, and of you know, and of uh, wood, of leather, and um, um, and, and or even weaker sometimes. There are not so many ways to make a shield, right? This is what we tend to kind of fixate in terms of details regarding. Uh, oh my god, what differences existed if a guy was equipped with that shield rather than another? Uh, how many shapes of shields can there be? Really, there, there aren't any, right? You can use and also overall what, what, what matters is the protective function that is not to change dramatically even with a different shape, right? Here I can see like a positive connection by with, say, between the, the, the of course the existence of the shield and Xenophon lack of you know the mention of the latter uh, it could mean I don't know something maybe it was more like a, a thickly packed phalanx of some sort we do not uh, have an idea for that matter if he was this could be an explanation like yes if the guy was characterized as a pikeman he may have not worn the typical shield that would have Presumably not just being like one attached to, say, even the the arm um, or slung on the shoulder, like some hoplites, uh, some pikemen would, would do historically. But again, it's obvious that the average calibus was just a guy with a with a shield. It was, you know, with, with a grip in in the center, hold with with with, a, with his hand and fighting with actually a shorter sh um, spear than the one we see here. All right, but the greaves are interesting. Like it, it tells these people is slightly better off than the average that is otherwise pretty um, pretty lame actually in the, in the surroundings. Uh, we see a long linen tunic, presumably kilted, and this makes like some sort of uh, uh, you know some sort of light protection as a matter of fact. Right, instead of the latter pterugus of an Hellenic corselet, the calibus had plated cords to provide protection below the cuirass, apparently. We know just this. How useful is this information? How useful were pterugus also in the Hellenic panoply? Not that much, right? Uh, the, they had their function, they had their importance, but hell is what you are armored with, like your torso that actually matters. So wh what are the advantages and the disadvantages of a of a long linen tunic, a presumably kilted one, and um, this bit is, as you know, must be filled with some information, so I will just um, uh, observe uh, these uh, these pros and cons uh, as elementary, pretty universal information. Um, so, kilted armor consisted of layers, as we've seen, of fabric, often cotton, linen in this case, that were kilted together with thread or yarn. And the layers of the fabric help to distribute the force of a blunt blow, right? Such as a mace or an axe, right? Which we may think actually being, as we've seen before, common weapons around. The, ma the mace also, because presumably the Kalubas cavalry was pr probably not, nor particularly numerous nor particularly heavy but still resented from the steps from steps warfare there was some armor around as we've seen so maces 
or an anti-armor weapon. Axes, too, to, to some degree. Um, so you would just distribute the force of the blunt blow across the entire area, reducing the impact on any one spot. But this doesn't mean that you can be hit, you know, by this and bleeding yourself uh, wide from an internal hemorrhage even if you have this kind of armor. Like, it's just simply making it less, especially for not the best uh, hits, like, easier to, to be dispersed, to be absorbed, right? Um, the kilted armor was designed to be flexible, of course. It was yet another advantage, allowing for greater mobility than solid armor, right? Um, the kilted design allowed for some give and take, which made it easier to move and maneuver on the battlefield. This was important for cavalry and infantry alike needed to be able to quickly respond to changing situations, especially you can imagine among the Kalubas in battlefields that were quite small after all. I mean, they weren't dramatic. This was not like a regional force as we've seen a cohesive people, etc. So most of the warfare was, as we said, raiding. Uh, like, uh, like, presumably on average, as always, like sort of small forces, and fighting also on broken ground. So, um, you need really the agility out there, and just the 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 cost is involved. Like, if the armor was generally less less expensive to produce than solid armor, as it didn't require the use of heavy metal. Um, elements. This made it more accessible to lower ranking soldiers and you know, the, the elite essentially who uh, alike who couldn't afford the more expensive armor options that would have existed. Consider that the Calibus at this point gravitate around the Achaemenid Empire that has the upper hand. Uh, the Persians have the best stuff around. These are subject people so they are partly demilitarized. That they have to follow uh, the, the kings of kings in their expeditions by sending contingents that could have been even slightly, like, you know, fairly well equipped, after all, if they were not particularly large. That Again, the idea of the Persian horde uh, of all these barbarians coming from nowhere and en masse, it's, it's not really how it was. Right? It was just like an impressive host, and the, the commanders tended to pick, obviously, the best of the of these people's forces that could be, yes, qualitatively expensive, but also contain in numbers so the thing could be balanced out. And so at that point, quality over quantity is going to be better. All right. Uh, again, we do not have any information about this people constituting any relevant part of the Achaemenid army, but of course this population, as we've seen, keeps living on after Alexander's conquest, the Roman one, uh, etc. Right, so they're not even technically a cohesive people, just they're described with this kind of uh, equipment. Kilted armor was also more breathable than solid armor, which helped to reduce the risk of heat exhaustion, discomfort in warm or humid environments. Um, this is true actually for most territories you can think in the civilized world at this point it's not just um, uh, you know connected specifically to the weather actually these lands um, in the Black Sea are they, they can be quite hot in summer but they can be fairly cold also in winter so um, the especially in the interland right you're gonna have snow and, and more so like it's um, I'm just now taking the, the whole thing too far, of course. They, they, every people had the same ways to, to cope with these extremes, right? But in general, for the lighter, uh, more, say, the average trooper here, uh, equipped naturally without much metal, like expensive items, like this kilted armor is, uh, is fantastic, right? It's the best choice in the first place, right? Um, the um, you you could at this point we could s even start it with metal plates we, we do not know like how the construction of other armor we will see it perhaps for other Anatolian models right but of course everything was pretty unstandardized and how we, how relevant is it really eventually how 
you put together a bit of metal um, to, to make the actual difference as a heavier trooper on the battlefield. The cons of Kilded Armor have also obviously to do with, um, for example, the vulnerability to piercing attacks. Kilted Armor was not effective against piercing attacks, such as arrows or swords, like they stick like into, like it could easily penetrate the, the fabric layers. And overall, of course, it, it offers a limited protection. Right. Uh, while, as we've seen, Kilted Armor provides some protection against blunt trauma, but, you know, the rigid armor is going to absorb, but may be also stronger, of course, in, in itself. Um, it was not as effective as solid armor, for, for sure, at stopping sharp blows or uh, slashing attacks as well. So this is true for the degree of lightness that we are documenting here. Right. Um, Speaking of the offensive armament, we're talking about that long spear. And again, this would have been found normally in the arsenals of these townsmen, of villagers and mountaineers. Uh, there's nothing specific about that, per se. Right? It's just Xenophon leaving us with this information. Uh, together with the fact that the Calibus were agriculturers, mostly, again, they were good at metal work apparently from forget from the general picture and they probably had sort of more warlike uh, ancestry but now through a process of sedentarization and various Indo-European migrations over the centuries like you couldn't quite notice it more than than much right um, it's uh, they would have been pretty violent people individually, right? But, the, like, again, their cohesion was somewhat to lose overall. It wasn't properly even too much of a florid interland. These are not, you know, heavily urbanized areas. There are important centers, uh, but there are bits existing at the outskirts of the major civilizations that are mostly like Mesopotamia, right? Um, a knife would have been stuck into their belt as well. The secondary weapons are kind of obvious, as we've seen axes, daggers, uh, this knife, especially like uh, if, if the pikeman is conceptually a guy who has to keep the enemy at a, at a certain distance by just um, like mostly relying on the mass in the in the wall that is created, keeping the enemy like at bay with, with this um, long range weapon like the knife is sort of better because it's not that heavy like you, you you're you not necessarily going to need uh, if you have for example to run away when the formation breaks you know that heavier object with you like it, it seems like a like splitting hairs here but it's they would calculate that like the the exhaustion on the battlefield will, does make you and the constant like uh need for being at your best does bring this levels of tactical uh, asset that of course we we can barely understand at least in the way it was normal at the time to engage in melee in the ways they would do it with, with a completely different mentality from our own um, and again in completely different context more than else than our own so say if we had seen a, a spearman or even an axeman, guys will surely go into battle just with an axe. They may have had some other single weapon, like a smaller axe, for example, or a dagger or something. You could pass to even using, you know, contemporarily with both hands respectively. Um, that would have made the, uh, let's say, the, the work, All right? So it's just a video that shows methodologically how few we know, first of all, but also how much we can say on the same basis. Because uh, there isn't really much you can say about it. But um, even for, you see, the, the reason why I make this video is, is for making people aware of how many sort of, how complex the world really was, right? How actually similar it was and especially when we come to see types of troops like these, right? That are really like basic to some degree. Uh, 
um, and um, and how, in fact, unspecific they were. How you can't quite simply even characterize them better or more than this, right? Um, the area occupied is pretty based. Here I inserted some uh, pictures that uh, that indicate lo the location of the Calubus in the estimated one. Uh, some see it more in the interland, some seemed closer to the Black Sea, but again, these were just one type of people, were otters, right? The Phasians, for example, um, the, you know, the, the Talcas, uh, the, they were like peoples that you legitimately, again, have never heard of, and that sort of are the ancestors or, the, you know, the part of other more famous groups, right? Um, but that, at some point, were called by, uh, were like this, by the ethnographers, distinguishing them in some way that it's not better um, precise, and that we have to go with. And just we get here the interesting info about their equipment by an author like Xenophon that you must, of course, mandatorily read uh, as a military historian. And um, so just imagine how they could be, right? I, I think that um, the pictures are good examples, right? It can be interesting to, to imagine, to see. Um, and again, absolutely, people capable of standing their ground to this spearman formation in some decent ground that the Achaemenids would have used them in, um, uh, let's say, just as a filler. Right? You need some cheap, reliable, uh, heavy infantry with some even anti-cavalry capacity, because let's imagine these spears being there mostly to counter even the same Persian cavalry, for example, and the ones of the steppes nomads that roamed around habitually these places, uh, and that would have, of course, been met in quite uh, unwelcoming terms by these locals that naturally were trying to survive with their meager income, not particularly fertile areas, by the way, um, quite mostly justly. Uh, here, as we've seen, there is a dispute between the Armenians that are also, unitly not quite the same thing that the Kalubas, and so there are all these neighbors that are not nice with one another in the first place, but mostly, like, in fact, being jealous of their cattle, um, you know, looking grimly from their fortified uh, hilltops, you know, who was approaching in this actually pretty interesting crossroad, in fact, of military cultures, of, of trade routes, etc., and sort of guarding and living off the surplus, having these lords there, like, managing uh, some control, some international relations, some trade business, like arms and armor production. Um, but most of the people remaining, uh, of course, without too much uh, material wealth um, in the first place. And so it's, it's a nice combination of resources you can rely on as an Achaemenid ruler whenever you want to, you know, call a few of these guys just to fill your ranks, like in case uh, your, you know, things go wrong, and, you know, there's nothing. It's, it's a completely average type of infantry for the, the time being, right? Uh, they would have had surely quite a tough time against, say, Xenophon's mercenaries that were the finest infantry uh, available uh, in the region, so much so that, as you know, in Achaemenid times, the actually the best forces, uh, I mean, excuse me, in Alexander's times, the best forces of the Achaemenids were actually saying Greek mercenaries. Um, here we are not that far away in time, it's the same century. So more or less, like, you know what we're talking about, you know, the standards, you know, the, the idea. There is this interesting formation, pikemen, you see cavalry around, I made a video about the Achaemenid armored cavalry uh, that was quite, like, the strongest around, except from some, uh, like, for example, the Sakas, right, yeah. we'll talk about some of these forces. These guys were, again, now mostly sedentarized, and so they, they would uh, have to cope every once in a while with cavalry, 
right? They had their own, naturally, but uh, it was less wild than the steps one and as such that also as people that would mostly uh, have this type of spearman available, right? Or someone with a bit of a shorter spear. Like, it doesn't take actually uh, much to make a spear pike, right? Also, the you know, the, the actually the Sarisai, people say, oh, they're eight meters long, it all the problem of speaking of the cubits and said, we'll have to make that video. Like, they, four meters and a half, right, is already, like, a pretty impressive pike, and you need a, a hell of a training to um, to use it uh, profitably. Here, Xenophon doesn't tell us how long these pikes were, like, the rather... Yes, they're long spears, but in the sense that they weren't something particularly concerning, that they had evidently some anti-cavalry function of sort, and or, again, it was just like a... could stop some ferocious mountaineers, chargers, or something like that, which was also a problem, because, again, here we're talking mostly about agriculturalists, stereotypically, but the mountaineers are that are all around are... And you can't quite easily distinguish the two things here, but they're surely sort of a bit less, like they're not all mountaineers. Um, the, the prevalence is this peasants fundamentally. And so the latter would have sort of better organized collective training, more surplus to, to do that. And so individually a bit less performing than the rougher mountaineer was also like, I don't know, physically and mentally more impressive. But... Um, uh, in an individual sense, but, but uh, um, everything falls into place, everything is plausible, everything makes sense. So this is also the beauty of history, of sources, ancient sources and beyond, that they they know where say something that is tremendously, like even when it may be unreliable, it's so tremendously out of place or implausible or absurd in the first. Everything seems to make sense in the broader picture, right? And so, even through this relatively scant information about uh, the Calibus panoply by Xenophon, we know about the former that uh, surely, like, Xenophon knew what he was talking about, right? And the way he talked about that is more interesting than pretending, of course, to be pretty picky about the, 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 say, positivistic description, accuracy, like I was saying, but also it doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, it, it does make it reliable at the same time. And we can't take it, of course, from from him. Uh, we'll keep talking about Achaemenid auxiliary units, because there are really many, and I think that's the fascinating, the interesting part, showing how multicultural this empire really was, how much, um, let's say, uh, different uh, peoples and cultures and traditions like, could blend into the, um, uh, like the, the Khamenei army that would set some standards, we can imagine these peoples also having uh, some Persian uh, instructors of some sort, they, they then being uh, supported by the Achaemenids. Here and there we see here Curus, uh, Cyrus intervening um, in settling this dispute as a sovereign, so there was something about the, of course, the, the necessity of keeping these people happy, and also they would have, like, in exchange for this protection, they would have had to send something, mostly surplus, but also troops, right, even just in a, it was a privilege, other than a duty, if you had that capacity of contributing to the Achaemenid army, you could gain more favor, but of course this is not, uh, politically, this is not like a particularly prosper land that can decide more and more than much. Right, just an area that you don't want also controlling this international trade of precious metal. Like you don't want to be too much upside down. You have to keep working, especially the Armenians that are a bit more um, 
sort of uh, in the north, right? So trying to escape a bit more than uh, command and control, and that want to expand towards, in fact, exactly this direction. You know that essentially Armenia would historically expand towards the southwest, right? In the in the later period, so it's exactly where the Kalubas lived, and so you can understand the attrition that would have arisen from these peoples that at some point would have also been encompassed by by these uh, later um, powers. All right, so um, the Georgian connection is also interesting, but uh, we know too few in the first place, and it's just, again, interesting to talk these peoples, showing them making people aware that they existed. This is really relevant. That's the, one of the most important reasons why I make these videos in the first place and in a bit way people to consider the the normality of but also the the reliability of evidence. Right? The fact that what we know historically sort of makes sense. Betwaiting people to see the the positive in history, like not making them live in a sort of strange, um, again, paranoid status in which they think that everything is made up, that we not know, or that this is so, you know, who can say that, why did the historians write, like, just not a history is something that people, especially the sources, have studied um, for a very, 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 very long time, right? So you're hardly the first person that can, can come up with something alternative about them. Uh, and it's um, uh, like it's kind of obvious and uh, adding these pieces helps even the historian sort of being able to evaluate better comparatively the other peoples right so that if you ever know about uh, a neighbor of the of the Calibus, you can say, ah, oh, look, you know, I know those guys, I know how they fought, I know more or less what their deal was and why, through that analysis, through that criticism. So, I kind of have an idea of what the region is, by sound degree. And um, this is pretty much it. We'll also come back, of course, at some point on the Achaemenid troops proper, right, the regulars, we can so say. Um, but all these other subject peoples are very fascinating as well. For today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.